I have to use notes these days because I'm not allowed any jokes or throwing any red books about. <laughs> OK. Look, I think, I, I think you've seen today that nothing could be starker than the contrast between the debate on the referendum, re referendum or on the, with regard to the progressives on the left and the debate on the right. I think the debate on the right is disfiguring discourse, political discourse in this country. People are in becoming increasingly tired of the ranting hysteria that we've seen from the right. To be frank, it's turning people off. The Tories seem to be transposing the gang warfare of the Eton playground and the, <laughs> the battles over the Tory leadership succession onto our national political scene. It's rancorous, personal and bitter, and to be honest, it's degenerated into name-calling and hyperbole of Project Fear with ludicrously exaggerated claims and counterclaims from both sides of the Conservative Party. Johnson's comparisons of the EU at the Third Reich and Cameron's claims of impending World War III, they just <laughs> beg a belief, to be honest. The economic, argument, the, economic, the economic argument has degenerated into one hand a description of the economic paradise post-Brexit and outside the single market, and on the other hand the near Pompeii-like condition of the City of London across the economy if we leave the EU. <laughs> To be frank, I think what you've all said today is that we just cannot go on like this. We cannot let the Conservatives and the rest of the right drag this debate into the intellectual gutter. Yeah. Our, our, our country and our people deserve better than this. We must not allow the decision over the future role of Britain in Europe to become embroiled any further in the infighting over who's to be the next leader of the Tory party or the exploitation, to be frank as well, of people's insecurities by the far right as well. So it's time now for those on the left and on the progressive spectrum to step in and it's our job now to retrieve this debate and save it from the right. The nature of the debate on the left is in, should be in dramatic contrast to that on the right and I think it already is, to be frank. It has to be collegiate and, in Labour Party terms, comradely. A discussion amongst friends and allies who seek the same goal but offer a different route and a mechanism to achieve that goal. So let's appreciate that there are those on the left who have a principled, rational and coherent argument why we should vote to leave. But we just believe they're wrong. Let's look at where we agree. First, on the left and on the progressive spectrum, we all accept that many of the immensely critical issues we face are transnational and they require transnational political solutions. Second, our consciences don't end at the Channel or at the North Sea. I want to look at some of the examples that you've been discussing today of the transnational challenges we face. On energy, in creating our energy to light our, and warm our homes and power our industries, to be frank, I don't want to poison the air breathed by families in Paris, Madrid or Athens, or put their very future existence or their descendants' existence at risk of cataclysmic consequences of climate change. You've discussed today the immense and imminent challenge of climate change that warrants an urgent transnational response from transnational political institutions. We know the EU is and could be an even more critical part of that much needed transnational architecture to respond to climate change. That's one of the reasons why we want to remain in. On resources, to, res to rise to the challenge of poverty and inequality both in Britain and across Europe, we need to harvest the resources of this rich continent effectively and fairly and wisely. How in all conscience can we turn a blind eye anymore to the City of London effectively operating like a funnel of, to offshore tax havens for the taxes of transnational corporations and super rich? <laughs> the, The taxes that should be paid to fund health care for the sick, the care for the elderly, the education of our young and tackling poverty, public funding that's desperately needed, not just in this country, but right the way across Europe, 
We know that if we clamp down here, the tax evaders and avoiders will move elsewhere. That's why European agreements are necessary and which form the basis of global agreements to track down and confront tax evasion and avoidance. That's why we need to stay in. Also, also, we shouldn't be able to sleep at night when we see refugee children's bodies washed up on the beaches of the Mediterranean. Memories are often sadly short. Europe learnt the harsh truth about after the Second World War of the consequences of the barbarity of war and conflict. It faced then a refugee crisis on a scale never witnessed before. But by coordinated transnational cooperation across Europe, refugees in their millions were supported and resettled. It took time and concerted action across the whole of Europe. Vital lessons were learned out about how to prevent, resolve and respond to conflicts. Setting up the European-wide institutions to bring people together was one of those lessons. If European unions were eventually established for anything, to be frank, it was to ensure that we could come together effectively to rise to those humanitarian challenges on our shores. We should do nothing that puts at risk the institutions that enable us to take this coordinated response to be organised to tackle the refugee crisis. That's another reason for staying in. And it's important that on the left, we don't avoid the issue of free movement and immigration, which is inevitably, inevitably coming to fore in this debate. None of us underestimate people's anxieties and emotions on this issue. We know that if we ignore it, we do so at our peril. So it has to be confronted head on. So point by point, let me make these. The British have been, and almost certainly will continue to be, one of the greatest beneficiaries of the free movement of people across Europe. Whether it's the Brits retiring to the warmth of the sun, or the quiet countryside of rural France, or the beaches of Greece, or our young people increasingly opting to study and work across Europe, or British workers taking work elsewhere when our own economy has slowed, it's the British that are reaping the rewards of travel and settlement that free movement brings us. Inward migration often keeps our own economy afloat, filling the skills gaps and supporting an ageing population pay its way. I speak as the grandson of an Irish immigrant, and I have to tell you, it's been the case for almost a century and a half that migrants have supported this economy and kept it afloat. I'm proud that it was often Irish men I'm, I'm proud that it was often Irish men who built most of the infrastructure on which you travelled to get here today, many of the buildings we work in and hold these meetings in, and it was Irish women, Irish women nurses who populated the NHS, cared for the elderly, taught in our schools and worked in the factories that rebuilt the economy after the Second World War and beyond. I'm proud of being the grandson of a migrant worker. But the, But we have to be straight with people as well. Of course, migration on any scale presents its problems of integration and pressure on public services. But all of these problems can be readily overcome. The vast bulk of the evidence demonstrates that migrants pay more into the economy than they take out. And despite general concerns about migration, all the evidence shows that on a one-to-one -one basis and within communities, the nature of British people is to be extremely welcoming to incomers. People generally just want to get on with each other and live in peace and harmony. And we mustn't let the Tories use immigration as the smokescreen for the cuts in public expenditure that they've introduced as our solution. Our, our public services, the NHS in particular, and our house building and infrastructure programmes would be in real difficulties but for the staff coming from across Europe. Where there are pressures in a particular area, the simple and obvious solution is specific programmes of government support to deal with them. To be frank, it's not rocket science. So finally, we have a duty also to address the issue of migration in a way that's positive, in which we as a community can respond to receive the benefits of migration at the same time overcome some of the short-term issues. The question for the left then is whether we can transform the operation of the European Union. It's the same question asked by the left 
about any state institutions, whether it's the local council, the national government, or any transnational institutions. The strategy we pursued on the left in the past and now has been described traditionally as in and against the state. The state isn't just a set of institutions, it's a relationship, usual one of dominance of the institution over the individual. Socialists and progressives have gone within these institutions to transform that relationship. That is to transform it into a democratic relationship where it is the democratic people's wishes that dominate, not the bureaucracy or the powerful economic interests that the bureaucracy often represents. So finally, that's the challenge question posed to the modern left. Can we and how can we democratically transform our European institutions? But the optimism is based upon this. For the first time in over a generation, there are movements and political forces mobilised and mobilising across Europe to respond to that challenge, but responding to it increasingly together. We have the opportunity now from today's debate to reroute the referendum debate away from Tory Brexit and into a debate about the democratic future of Europe, about another Europe. about another Europe, a Europe that's not just possible, but urgently and vitally needed, where we can say, yes, we're proud of being British, but we're also proud of the European future that we're creating in solidarity. Solidarity.